here tonight in the name of Jesus to declare unto you the word of God that you might be convicted of your sin that you might give up your sin turn away from your path of destruction enter into life receive eternal life as a free gift from Jesus and walk a life of obedience to him that's what he's calling you to tonight he's calling you to himself he's calling you out of your sin he's calling you to faith and repentance and the first word Jesus preached in his ministry was repent that's the word I want to be filled in my mouth it's the word repent what does that word repent mean? it means to forsake your sin to give it up to walk in the opposite direction to walk away from sin to walk towards the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you and rose from the grave defeating death the same Jesus who commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness are you ready for that day it's a great and terrible day for the sinner judgment day but it's a wonderful and mighty day for the saint the one who truly knows Jesus the one who's been born again of the Holy Spirit who's living an obedient life to Jesus Christ don't think to say to yourself if you're out here tonight at the bars and clubs to lust and to get drunk or to to be sexually immoral in any way to have filthy words come out of your mouth listen to wicked music don't think you can say in your heart well I'm, I'm going to go to church on Sunday you know, your church attendance two days from now will not help you in your sin right now it does not give you any kind of ticket to heaven to do this tonight and to go to church on Sunday you need repentance to surrender your life to Jesus and give up your sin the Bible says do you not know rhetorical question do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God do not be deceived don't deceive yourself the unrighteous are not going to inherit his kingdom the scripture makes it clear he who covers his sins shall not prosper but whoever confesses and forsakes his sins shall find mercy see the mercy of God is available to you tonight it's a limited time offer you're not guaranteed tomorrow you're not guaranteed the next minute let alone tomorrow morning you know back when I was a drunkard and a partier and a club goer there'd be times I'd wake up the next morning not knowing how I got there not knowing the person I was laying next to completely oblivious to everything that happened to me from the time I got drunk to the time I woke up the next day with a headache and dry mouth sometimes with my own vomit near me what a blessed life huh what a glorious life it was for me as a drunkard now what a foolish life what a waste of my life it was for me to be a drunkard to go to clubs, to party, to dirty dance, to listen to filthy music. It did me no good. It left me in the filth and the muck and mire of my sin. That doesn't have to be you. You don't have to go through the same things I went through. And I was in danger. I was reckless. Back in those days, I wasn't even 21 years old and I was getting drunk. I was often driving drunk never got caught by the mercy of God but what if I was I lost my license at that time point in time I was in the army when I got court-martialed out of the army sin never does you any good never will you know these, in this day and age you basically need 
a driver's license and a car to get back and forth to a job to make a living, to provide for yourself and maybe your family. But if you're foolish, you might get your license taken away. If you're foolish, you might get in trouble with the law, you might ruin your life. And then maybe you'll turn to making money in illegal ways, like selling drugs. Some women even sell their bodies. These women who sell their bodies don't even have to do it in person anymore. They can just get a, a, some kind of video channel somewhere and show off their body to anyone who wants to see it, who will pay to see it. Not understand they can never take that back. They can never live that down. Sin has consequences in this life. So the consequences for sin are not simply just going to hell in eternity. The consequences for sin are not just at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Oftentimes the consequences for sin are here in this life. I know, I know people who have gotten speeding tickets and pay fines over $600 per ticket. What a waste of your money, what a waste of your life, what a waste of your time to sin, to get drunk. What are you, what are you searching after tonight as you come here? Some kind of lust of the flesh being fulfilled? Some kind of lust being fulfilled that you're seeking after tonight? It's not what God wants for you. So the Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. That's who you need to seek. Don't need to seek after sin. Sin brings consequences in this life. It brings judgment, eternity. It brings misery, conviction, guilt, and shame. Rightly so, because it's wrong. But holiness brings peace. It brings comfort. The peace of God escapes the sinners. The peace of God escapes the sinners. There is no peace with God for the ungodly. There's only peace with God for the righteous. There's only peace with God for the righteous. The Bible says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking, de speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. That's the difference right there. And how God's going to handle the wicked and the righteous. Don't be wicked tonight. Turn from your wickedness. Turn to Jesus, the righteous one who died for you and rose again from the grave, defeating death, and commands all men everywhere to repent. Repent of sexual immorality. Repent of drunkenness. Repent of using God's name in vain. And all manner of filthy language. The Bible says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that may impart grace to the hearers. Jesus said, out of the mouth comes the overflow of the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. See, and Jesus says, you'll give an account for every idle word. Be brought into judgment. So as that those filthy words continue to flow, from your mouth, you need to understand as a sure sign that your heart is not right with God, that your heart is unclean. When you have a potty in your mouth because you have a sewer for a heart. That's what the Bible teaches. But the Bible also teaches that God can make you clean. That's my testimony. Before I became a Christian, my mouth was full of curse words and blasphemy and wickedness. When I became born again of the Holy Spirit, my mouth was cleaned up immediately. No one had to tell me to stop cussing and stop blaspheming God's name. It just changed. God changed me. And God can change you like that too. 
I mean, it's like the, the, like the faucet was turned off. Because there was no wickedness to pull from anymore. It just, it just wasn't there. Because God cleaned my heart up. God can clean your heart the same way he cleaned my heart. He can remove from you your hard heart of stone and give you a soft and tender heart. A heart that's soft and tender to his ways and his doings and his word. He'll cause you to walk in his ways. But you got to repent. you got to give it all up. Whereas Jesus Christ said in John 5.14 and also in John 8.11, Go and sin no more. So he's calling out to you tonight through me. Just a man. A man who's been saved by Jesus, been living for Jesus for about 20, almost 26 years now. But transformed, changed from the inside out. Used to be a wicked sinner. But Jesus Christ has changed me. Now I live a different life. Many of you may, go to be, may be planning to go to church on Sunday. You understand that going to church is not going to help you, not going to save you, not going to give you a free pass into heaven as you continue to live in sins. You also need to understand that if you've been baptized before, or you've asked Jesus into your heart, or pray what's called the sinner's prayer, those things do not make you saved either. If you got baptized and hadn't truly repented of your sins, all you did was become a wet sinner. If you asked Jesus into your heart or prayed the sinner's prayer but didn't repent of your sins at that time as well, didn't turn from them, forsake them, be changed by Jesus, and you don't understand that all you were doing was praying some Harry Potter incantation, did not help you one bit. See, God's not looking for certain words out of your heart, out of your mouth. He's looking for a humble heart, a broken, contrite heart, a repentant heart. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for certain words. You now, if you offend somebody, you hurt somebody who you love, who you care about, of course, if you offend them or hurt them, you don't love them in that moment, at the least. But if you offend or hurt someone, do something wrong to somebody, does someone need to write out an apology for you? For you to apologize to them? Does someone need to tell you the words to say? And what if you read off an apology to someone who you did something wrong to? Would they really think you were being genuine if someone else wrote out the apology for you? Of course not. The so God's not looking for you to repeat some words after somebody. God's looking for sincerity and genuineness of heart, repentance and humility and brokenness. That's what God's looking for. Childlike, humble faith. That's what God's looking for. If you'll do that for him, he will give you the gift of eternal life. He doesn't owe it to you. You don't deserve it. You can't ever earn it. But he offers it to you as a free gift. If you come to him in childlike humility, if you come to him in repentance, he can give you what you don't deserve. His grace, his mercy, his kindness. His name is Jesus. He has the name above every name. Who gave, who determined that Jesus Christ would be the name above every name? Well, it was God the Father. He determined to give Jesus the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Watch your filthy mouth, sinner. God's going to call you to give an account of that filthy mouth and your wicked heart. Oh, fuck you then, bitch. You right, I ain't gonna bitch on you because you're my sister and you're drunk. Take your drunk ass on.
Aren't people so loving out here tonight towards each other? Filthy language, threatening to fight each other. It's a real safe place to be, huh? You know, in the kingdom of God and in the true church, people love Jesus and love each other. There's no fighting and bickering and cussing and threatenings. There's no brawling. There's no macho-ness. See, in the kingdom of God, amongst the people of God, there is true love. And love is patient. It suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Does not envy. It keeps no record of wrongs does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth believes all things hopes all things endures all things love never fails that's true love there's no love in these kind of places there's no love in these places wickedness abounds drunkenness abounds and people's hearts who are coming to these places those of you who are coming to these places you already have a wicked heart already you add some, some little bit of weed to it, a little bit of alcohol to it, it becomes 10 times worse. This amplifies all the wickedness in your heart as you become intoxicated, buzzed, drunk, and high. It's not God's will for you. It's the way God made you. God didn't make you for this nonsense. God made you for himself. Right now, you're not living for him if you're in sin. But he's calling you to himself. He's calling you to make a decision tonight, to change your mind tonight, to change your heart tonight, to give your life to him tonight. He says, come to me, and I will give you rest. Right now, the turmoil in your heart, the anger in your heart, you know, 1 John 3.15 says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer at heart. And every murder that's ever happened started with some kind of hatred. The first murder ever was when Cain killed his brother Abel. He was angry because his sacrifice was not accepted by God because he didn't offer it the right kind of sacrifice, the right kind of heart. But Abel's sacrifice was, he was jealous, he was angry, he hated his brother, and he killed his brother. Before he killed his brother, God reasoned with Cain. He said, Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. So he was calling Cain to do what is right. He was telling Cain he has the power the ability to do what is right and calling him to actually do that what is which is right he said if he doesn't do that which is right if he doesn't repent doesn't surrender his heart to him and to his ways well sin's knocking it's knocking on the door of your heart it's it's calling it's pers we're personifying sin in this this passage of genesis 4 it's calling to you to be wicked but God is calling to you to be righteous. God is calling to you to submit your heart and your life to Him. Stop submitting your heart, your life, your time, your mind to sin and the devil. Instead, submit your heart, your mind, your life to Jesus and to holiness. And there's no one in the world who deserves your love like Jesus. And there's no one who's loved you like Jesus. Not your mom, not your dad, not your spouse, not your children, not your boyfriend or a girlfriend. No one's loved you like Jesus. Oftentimes, a stranger or a boyfriend or girlfriend will tell you they love you because they want to do wicked things with you. They want you to let down your guard and be vulnerable and then do sexually immoral things with them. It's not the kind of love Jesus had. Jesus' love was sacrificial. 
Jesus' said love was true. It was real at the cross. And he calls you to himself. He calls you to himself. He laid down his life for you at the cross and died for you. See, true love is sacrificial. True love is not fake. It's not two-faced. True love does not stab someone in the back. You know, Jesus experienced that kind of fake love from one of his own disciples, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him for some silver coins. And when he approached him in the Garden of Gethsemane, he betrayed him with a kiss. What a wicked way to betray the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Many of you do the same thing, though. You'll go to church on Sunday. You'll sing praises to Jesus. You'll pray to Him. You'll listen to sermons about Him. You'll sing songs about Him. But then on Monday, you're back to your sin. Maybe it's Sunday night you're back to your sin. And the Bible says, let love, Romans 12, 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. That's real love. And God is a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. So while your so-called friend, your so-called boyfriend, girlfriend will love you with a fake, fraudulent love, a hypocritical love, a love that influences you to sin, a love that's two-faced, backstabbing. That's not the kind of love Jesus has. Jesus offers his true love, his graciousness, his kindness, his patience with you. I mean, the fact that Jesus Christ is allowing you to continue to live and breathe his air while you blaspheme his name and sin against him day in and day out, that's proof that he's patient with you. That's proof that he has a kindness and love towards you that you're not worthy of. I mean, how many of you would do that for one of your friends? How many, that would how many of you would love your enemies in that way? And it's not just God having mercy upon you and not sending you to hell for your sins because right now you deserve to go to hell for your sins the sins you continue to commit. And God could take you at any point in time if he wants to. But the fact that he's not taking you and hasn't taken you yet is proof positive of his mercy. And he goes above and beyond that. He gives you food to eat, water to drink. He takes care of you in many ways that you're ignorant of or indifferent towards. You're not grateful for or thankful for. He does these things for you, even though you blaspheme his name and hate him and sin against him continually. That right there, these facts I just gave you, should cause you to rethink your life, should cause you to look at the love of God towards you. Not only at the cross, but his practical love towards you and these things I just mentioned, should cause you to come to repentance. That is the only true response to such love as he has shown at the cross. So give up your sin to surrender your life and love him back. Or as the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 15, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again this is what God offers you turn to Jesus and live the Bible says God takes no delight in the death of the wicked but rather that they turn and live but man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble he comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. See, you think you have 
all the time in the world, tonight, tonight could be your last night. That's just the facts, it's truth. I hope it's not if you're in your sin, but it could be. That's why the Bible says, whereas we do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Your life's gonna vanish away. You're gonna die. You give an account of your sins to God. Don't continue in your sins. Give up your sins, turn to Jesus and live. But if you don't, the Bible says, what is the allotment of God from above? What is the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Of course it is. It's what, you, it's what you're owed. See, God doesn't just have an inheritance for the righteous. He also has an inheritance for the wicked. And that's his inheritance for you. That's what your wickedness will earn you. Scripture says, the wages of sin is death. The Bible says, whatever man sows, that he shall also reap. If you sow to please the flesh, you'll reap destruction, corruption, depravity. If you sow to please the spirit, you'll reap everlasting life. What the scripture teaches. What will you do? Where will you go? When your time comes, when your time on earth comes to an end, and you're called to give an account of your life, what will become of you then? Where will you end up? At the judgment seat of Christ? Jesus says in Revelation 22, the last chapter of the whole Bible, says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his works. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You know, when Jesus returns with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You see, it's not just this ungodliness you do or say, but the way in which you do it, your heart in doing it, the intentions of your heart when you're doing this sin, God is going to judge those things as well. Turn from your sin while you still can. Turn to Jesus Christ while you still can. Jesus Christ died for you. What's that? Allah didn't die for you. Allah is a demon. Allah can't help you. Only Jesus Christ can help you. Allah is not the God of the Bible, the God of Islam. It's a fake God. You know, the God of Islam, Allah, the Arabic word that just means God, but still, Allah is personified and characterized in the scriptures you find in the Quran. He calls himself the greatest deceiver. You know, in Christianity, you know, the father of lies is the devil. So it seems to me that the God of Islam is the devil of Christianity. The devil cannot help you. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He hates you. He does not care for you. There's a rising in our day and age and people who call themselves Satanist. Even recently in Massachusetts, there was something called the Satan Con where lots of Satanists gather together. And some of them will say that they, they're not really following Satan. He's a mythical creature. He doesn't really exist. They're just, you know, the characters that he has, they want to exude those things. 
And maybe some of them really believe that, but they're deceiving themselves because they really are following Satan just like you are if you're a sinner. If you're getting drunk, you're getting high, you're fornicating, being lustful, sexually immoral, looking at pornography, having filthy words come out of your mouth, you are not following Jesus Christ. You are following the devil, the one who hates you, the one who does not care for you, the one who wants you to go to hell for all eternity. If you're a sinner, you're following him. But if you want to follow Jesus Christ, the one who loved you and died for you and desires to give you life and life abundantly, then you need to repent. You need to humble yourself. Come to him in faith, in childlike faith. Cry out to him for mercy and repentance. Cry out to him to change your life, to make you new. For that's what he desires to do. And the Bible says, the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. He's near to the brokenhearted and saves such as have a contrite spirit. That's Psalm 34, 18, and one before that, Psalm 51, 17. You see, so God loves humility. He loves brokenness and contrition over sin. When someone is truly broken and contrite over their sin, He will save them. He will change them. He will deliver them from sin. The Bible says He wants to deliver you from darkness and convey you into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. The Bible says that God wants to change you to such a degree that you'll become a new creature. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. For Jesus call, says in John 3, he calls it being born again. If someone is truly born again, they've been changed. They've been transformed from the inside out. There were people in Jesus' day who were seemingly clean on the outside, but inside they were still sinners and full of wickedness. Pharisees, Sadducees, the lawyers, the scribes. Jesus saw them and had strong rebukes for them. And Jesus likened to this, if you're gonna eat a bowl of cereal, would you rather have the outside of the bowl clean or the inside of the bowl clean? I don't know about you, but I'd rather have the inside of the bowl clean. Recently I went to a restaurant with my family and like four times in a row, we had water or drinks with black stuff floating around in them. You better believe we sent it back. We don't want to drink that. I guess the ice was dirty. But they were gave me a cup that was had a little bit of dirt on the bottom of it, on the outside. It wouldn't have bothered me. I wouldn't have cared. But God wants to clean you up on the inside. Now, and also, when God cleans you up on the inside, you'll, he'll also get clean on the outside. But the inside is the most important one. So you can play the church game. You can play like you're, you're good and you behave yourself and you're good with the law. You can, you can act like those things are true when they're not. Well, or act like you're okay when no one's looking or when someone's looking. But then when no one is looking, you do whatever you want to do. But you understand that when you're Living your life, you shouldn't be living your life to please others. You should be living your life to please Jesus Christ. For the eyes of the Lord are in every place. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. See, they're everywhere. So if you're living to please Jesus, you're living for the glory of God, you'll always be living right. You'll always be doing what you should be doing. You won't be staying up late at night looking at pornography. You won't be getting high with your friends when your parents aren't looking. 
when we're getting drunk underage, trying to get away with things that are against the law, you're going to do what is right in God's eyes. And then God can say to you in the end, when you stand before Him in judgment, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. There's that rest that God promises you in Matthew 11. He wants to give you that rest. But there is no rest for the wicked. There's no peace for the wicked. Never will be. Not in this life. Not in the life to come. Do you understand how, how the Bible describes hell? It's a place where the worm never dies. And the fire is never quenched. Never put out. It's a place of outer darkness. Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's called a lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The Bible talks about how the place is big enough to hold as many as who want to go there. Hell is eternal. There are no exits. There is no way out of hell. If you enter into hell, there will be no way out for you. There is no fire alarm, no fire sprinkler system in hell that can put out the flames of hell. There's no fire exits, no way to get out of hell once you go there. But there's hope for you now, while you're still alive. If you'll submit to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, to surrender to the counsel of God's Word, He will bless you. He will help you. He calls you to Himself. Isn't that amazing? The God of all the universe cares enough about you and me to send His only Son to suffer and bleed and die on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago as a sacrifice for sins that you might receive eternal life. When you think about it, the God of the universe created everything. We're so short we're so short sighted, so near sighted. When the last time you gaze up at the stars, considered how mighty they are, how enormous, how powerful they are. The God of the Bible created every, all those things. You know, about a million of our earth will fit into the sun, and millions of our sun will fit into the biggest star we're aware of. There's innumerable uh, galaxies and stars in each galaxy. And it's all contained in the universe. You know what universe means? Una, one verse sentence. One spoken sentence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. It's all contained in what God said. God didn't how to take substances from someplace else that was made by somebody else and start putting them together to make our universe. He simply spoke everything into existence. And this God loves you and me. He cares for us. He loves us. But a true love, a sacrificial love. He calls you to himself. He calls you to obey. You may say, well, I believe in God. And the Bible says, well, you believe in one God, you do well. But even demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Yes, faith without works is dead. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. You give account for every idle word on Judgment Day. Oh, what up, man? 
Father Jesus, turn from your sins. I oh. Sinners will not inherit God's kingdom. It's not going to help you if you're a sinner. Going to church not give you a free ticket to heaven. No, not if you're a sinner, you're not. Not if you're a sinner, you're not. Your filthy mouth shows you're a sinner too. I'll talk all night. Why are you still talking? Need to repent. Give your life to Jesus Christ truly. Surrender your life to Him. You can't bless anyone with God, man. You're a sinner. You can't bless anybody if you're a sinner. You don't have the blessing of God to bless others. Sinners are not blessed with God, that's for sure. But God does bless the righteous. His ears are open to their cries. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. As the man who is blessed, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but he delights in the law of the Lord and meditates in it day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. Whatever he does shall prosper. His leaves shall also not wither. But the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff with the wind drives away. They shall not stand in the judgment. See, the blessed one is the one who really loves God. Jesus said, He who loves me will keep my commandments. Says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. See? That's what Jesus desires to do for you. He wants to have this relational love towards you. Right now, the love God shows towards you as a sinner is the love he showed towards every single human being who's ever lived on the face of this planet. His patience, his kindness, his mercy. But you'll never truly know the depths of God's love until you give your life to Him. Until you truly surrender all to Him. You'll never know the depths of Christ's love for you. So I love everybody here, but my love with my wife, my love with my children is a lot different than my love for you. It's a different kind of love. There's a relational love. Follow Jesus Christ. He died for you. Sin leads to hell. Sin leads to destruction. Sin leads to horrible consequences on earth. Don't continue in sin. It'll never do you any good. Maybe you don't have very good examples around you. Maybe you're hanging around the wrong crowd. Maybe your parents weren't good examples. Maybe your siblings weren't good examples. But you can overcome all that in the mighty name of Jesus. He is mighty to save. He saves to the uttermost. He's here tonight to deliver you from your sin. If you humble yourself and cry out to him in faith and repentance, he will save you. Or as the Bible says in Acts 3.19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. That times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing can come from His presence. He can blot out your sins. He can have mercy upon you if you repent and be converted. What does it mean to be converted? Be changed, born again, delivered. 
Now continue on the same path everyone else is on. Being the same old scenario everyone else is. But being what God meant you to be. The Bible says the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in a day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. You ever notice that most of the sinning that is done is done at night? It's like people have this thought in their heart and mind, whether consciously or not, uh, less people can see what I'm doing. But God still sees. His eyes are on the ways of men, and He sees all their steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. You know, God even sees your thought life. When we talk about judgment day, you may think he's judging your, your words and your deeds, but God even sees your thought life. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows about your lustful thoughts, your angry, your hateful, your bitter thoughts. He knows what you're, what you're going to say before you say it. For those of us who pray to him with true prayers, he knows what we're going to ask for before we ask for it. That's what the Bible says. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. You see, so the secret thing, the things you don't tell anyone else about, God knows about it. The Bible says, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. The Bible says the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. See, lying is included in that passage. That's Revelation 21.8. Lying is included. If you're, if you're a liar, that's considered to most people to be a quote-unquote small sin. It's something unfortunately people do all the time. Lie. Call them white lies, fibs, half-truths. Call them whatever you want. That lie is a lie. And the old saying, liar, liar, pants on the fire, is actually biblically accurate. That's where liars will end up, in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's where liars will end up. It's even the smallest of sins, quote unquote, people think it's small. Lying will cost you your soul. Lying will send you to hell. If you're continuing in sin and knowing the truth, you're playing games with your soul. Don't love God while you're a sinner. You don't love yourself while you're a sinner. You don't love anyone while you're sinning, young man. You're telling me how to preach and you're sinning? You're a sinner and you're telling me how to preach? I think you better wake up, man. You're, you're actually sinning, you're telling me how to preach. How about you preach to yourself? Give up your sin, you're right with God. So 
amazing the blindness people have. You know, if someone who's never worked in a car before is telling a mechanic who's been doing it for 30 years how to work on a car, it would make no sense. Or someone who has worked on cars before but messes them up every single time tells a mechanic who has a perfect record how to fix a car, doesn't make any sense. It makes about as much sense as the sinner telling me how to preach God's word. And the Bible says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So I don't want to forsake the blessing of God. No, I want to keep the blessing of God and I forsake it in my life. I can't take heed to the counsel of the ungodly. The counsel of the ungodly does not come from God's word. But the ungodly does not have God's word hidden in their heart. The ungodly does not have God's word hidden in their heart. Because if you did have God's word hidden in your heart, you would not sin against him, according to Psalm 119, verse 11. You wouldn't sin against him if you had his word hidden in your heart. The Bible says, it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the songs of fools. I'm sure you're going to hear lots of songs of fools tonight, whether you're going to this club closest to me or the bar across the street. I'm sure you'll be listening to lots of wicked music sung by fools who don't know God, who don't love Jesus who sing about wickedness and glorify sin and the devil. That's the very definition of the song of a fool. But it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise. The Bible says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of wisdom, the fear of God. And by the fear of God, one departs from evil. So if you begin to fear God, you're departing from evil. And now you begin to be wise. Now you know the truth of God's word. If you want wisdom, fear God. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is man's all. King James says the whole duty of man to fear God and keep his commandments. Don't be deceived. You're not going to live forever in this world. Your life will come to an end eventually. If you die in your sins, you're going to end up in hell. Don't let that be you. Don't let that happen to you. Don't die in your sins and go to hell. Rather, repent of your sins and receive the mercy of God. The mercy of God is a limited time offer. You could die today. If you die today, you'll end up in trouble. Those who die in their sins get put in God's jail cell. It's called Hades. What name? Not mine. I don't want it. Might as well leave it on the ground, man. That's where it was. Yeah. Might come back and find it. But the mercy of God is a limited time offer. He's offering it to you today. You could die in your sins tomorrow. You might not have another chance to get right with God. He's calling you today. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. If you hear his voice, repent of your sin. He's calling out to you tonight. He's offering you his mercy. God hates all workers of iniquity according to the scripture. God's going to deal with the workers of iniquity with, with his anger and his vengeance.
people are so tough when they're in their cars driving by. You're so tough when you stand before a puny man like me. You won't be so tough before the judgment seat of Christ. Get all that toughness, that pride out now. The Bible says God opposes the proud. God's against the proud. God resists the proud. He gives grace only to the humble. The Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Pride defined scripturally is when someone thinks more highly of themselves than they ought to. That's what pride is scripturally. You think more highly of yourself than you ought to. But humility is truly seeing yourself in truth, seeing yourself for who you really are, seeing yourself as God sees you. And if you're a sinner, that's how God sees you, as a sinner, a sinner who needs a savior, a sinner who's on their way to hell, a sinner deserving of God's judgment and wrath. If you're a sinner, that's how God sees you. But God's view of you can change. He will, the Bible says he can justify you. What does that mean? It means he can give you right standing with him. But as a sinner, you stand under his judgment, under his wrath, deserving of all of it for all eternity. But if you forsake your sins and turn to Jesus, you're not worthy of his mercy, worthy of his grace, but he gives it to you as a free gift because he loves you and cares for you. He wants you to come into relationship with him. And when you do that, if you choose to do that, the Bible says he will justify. In other words, he won't hold your sins against you any longer. But instead, will treat you as if you had never committed them. Even though he knows all about all the thousands and thousands of sins you've committed in your life, he hasn't forgotten about them. He doesn't have a bad memory. He knows all about them, but he acquits you. He pardons you. He forgives you. And the word forgive means to not hold against any longer. Forgiving someone does not mean you forget about their crimes against you. It means you treat them as if they had never committed them against you. You don't hold it against them any longer. But it means to forgive somebody. And God is willing to forgive you because of what Jesus did at the cross. He's willing to forgive you. The Bible says Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we can be healed. All we like sheep, uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. So Jesus was a sacrifice for sin. Probably the most well-known scripture in the Bible, although people take it the wrong way. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, he who does not believe is condemned already. He's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. And light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Would not come into the light lest their deeds should be exposed. See, so many know John 3.16 and John 3.17, but don't know John 3.18, 19, and 20. You know, if you don't believe in Jesus, and believe in the Bible doesn't mean just have a thought about him or agree with him on some things or believe he existed. 
believing in Jesus is believing in what he said too. You can't detach Jesus Christ from the things he said. So to believe in Jesus is to believe what he said. And to believe what he said is also to do what he said. How can you believe it and not do it? That'd be foolish. The people will not come into the light of Jesus Christ because their deeds are evil. And men love darkness rather than light. So the things you're engaging in tonight is darkness. And the light of Jesus Christ is shining for me and my brother tonight through the gospel tracks, the signs, the word being preached. And our hope for you is that you'll hear the word, you'll receive the word, believe the word, and repent, become born again, be changed from the inside out, and live a life of obedience to God. That's our hope for you. We know there is a hope because of Jesus. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who comes to you and convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's right, don't go to hell. Don't be a sinner. Sin leads to hell. Fornication, drunkenness, pot smoking, a filthy mouth, lying, stealing, covetousness, lust, it all leads to hell. Now, Jesus Christ said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. And the context there is what comes right before that. If you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart with that woman. You see? Jesus sees your heart, your mind, what's truly going on on the inside. You may not be able to consummate that sexual immorality in your mind, in action, in a physical way, but God still sees your sin in your heart. If you're looking upon these immodestly dressed women tonight with lust in your heart, God's going to call you to give an account of that. This woman who dressed with tight clothing, revealing clothing, clothing to draw your eyes to certain parts of their body, you give an account for those things. And the solution to that, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Those that are out here tonight drinking beer, smoking weed, smoking cigarettes, vaping. Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And those who walk to the clubs and the bars tonight to dance in wicked ways and move in wicked ways with your feet, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5, if your feet cause you to sin, cut them off and cast them from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So what is Jesus Christ saying in Matthew 5, 28 through 30? Is he, is he really wanting you to pluck out your eye and cut off your hand and cut off your foot? Is that what he's communicating? Of course not. That won't stop you from sinning. But he's telling you to take the sin seriously. Your sin is going to cost you everything in the end. You get this little bit of pleasure from your, your sin for a short period of time, a short season. You're having a good old time in your sin, but it will not be a good old time in eternity when you reap the rewards of your sin, when you reap the consequences of your sin. So Jesus Christ is trying to communicate to you in Matthew 5, 28-30 to do what it takes to get the sin out of your life. Take drastic measures to get the sin out of your life. Don't play around with sin. Sin's going to cost you everything. You may think it's some kind of jack-in-the-box toy. It's really a rattlesnake coiling up to bite you and kill you. Don't be deceived. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He hates you. He wants you to go to hell. 
does not want you to repent. He'll do whatever he can to get you to not repent. To send other people into your life, distractions, pleasures into your life. I've seen it happen myself. I've seen people who used to be following Jesus. The devil sent some kind of temptation into their life. And instead of following Jesus Christ and staying on the difficult path that leads to life, they depart from it and get on the broad path that leads to destruction. The Bible says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and again are entangled in them and overcome the latter end for them is worse than the beginning for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than have known it and to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them there's many the Bible says the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some of the depart, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. As people deceiving themselves with doctrines of demons. One of the greatest lies the devil has ever sowed, especially in the American so-called church, is that uh, no holiness is required for the Christian that there's no difference between the Christian and the unbeliever except that they believe on Jesus and go to church every once in a while. Nothing could be further from the truth. God demands holiness. <clears throat> and if you're not living a holy and obedient life to Jesus Christ, it's a sure sign you don't know Him, you don't have His grace, you aren't cleansed of your sins, and you don't love Him. What the Bible teaches but so many professing Christians are so deceived and believing they can live whatever way they want and still go to heaven in the end. You've been deceived if you believe that. It's not true. The Bible says, this is the message we heard from Jesus and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see? If you claim to know Jesus, and you claim to be cleansed of your sins, but you continue to walk in them, you're like a pig who was given a bath and goes back to wallowing in the mud. You haven't been changed. God doesn't want you to be a pig. God wants you to be a sheep. One of his sheep, because he is a shepherd. And the sheep, his sheep know his voice. And they love him and they follow him. But the scripture teaches At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, Jesus says, on, a, on the day of judgment, many will say to him, Lord, Lord, do not cast out demons in your name, perform many miracles and signs and wonders in your name. And he'll say to them, away from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. There are so many people on judgment day who will have a rude awakening so they deceived themselves into thinking that they knew God, that Jesus Christ was their Lord and Savior, but He wasn't either. In Romans 10 it says that if you confess with your mouth and believe, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall have eternal life. What those sirens mean is a, a warning coming through. Emergency. 
Well, there's a greater emergency tonight than an ambulance going by or a truck that's attached to an ambulance going by. It's a greater emergency. No, it wasn't mine. Someone dropped it a long time ago. Was it yours? Repent of your sins. Forsake your sins. Go and sin no more. Follow Jesus Christ. Who died for you. Rose again from the grave, defeating death. And commands all men everywhere to repent. To the greater emergency tonight, not an ambulance or a police car driving by with their sirens on. Or a fire truck. There's a bigger fire going on. A greater fire that is to come. The Bible says for hell was established of old. Yes, for the king it is prepared. He has made it deep and large. It's pyre. It's fire with much wood. And the breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone kindles it. See, hell is God's hell. Hell is not the devil's hell. The devil does not rule over hell with a pitchfork and horns and a tail. The devil himself will be in hell. Hell is God's hell. And the breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. It's plenty big. Big enough to fit anyone in it and everyone in it. But of course, God wants none to go there. The Bible says God is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, God doesn't want you to perish, doesn't want you to go to hell, and doesn't want you to continue in sins. No, I'm not turning it off. What I'm saying is more important than whatever your phone call is. What's that? It's amazing how people value certain things over others. The Word of God should take supreme importance in your life. You know, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's Word will never pass away. The Bible says the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of God endures forever. People watch wicked things on TV, on movie screens, and listen to wicked things in their ears with their podcasts and their music. But when the Word of God is being preached, they ignore, they despise, they reject, they tell the preacher to shut up. Well, this preacher's not shutting up. Because what I have to say is important, not because I'm saying it, because it's God's Word. And God's Word is important. And you need to take heed unto God's Word. Because God's going to judge you according to His Word. You ready for that? Ready to be judged according to God's word? Are you prepared to meet your maker? Are you ready to stand before God on judgment day to give an account of every thought, word, and deed? If you're in line tonight, you're not. If you're in the line to the club tonight, you're currently on the broad path that leads to destruction. But here tonight we have two people who are on the narrow path that leads to life that few find. And we're calling out to you from the narrow path to come onto the, our path that leads to life and come off the broad path that leads to destruction. So we're crying out to you tonight to flee the wrath of God that is to come. To repent or perish. To turn from your sin. 
and follow Jesus Christ. And when it comes to sin, you should be looking at yourself. If you have sin in your life, you shouldn't be pointing the finger at anybody else. If you have sin in your life, you should be pointing the finger at yourself. Deal with those wicked words come out of your mouth. Deal with those wicked thoughts, those evil deeds. The things you do in public, the things you do in private, deal with them in truth. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. The Bible says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. Don't deceive yourself. You're hearing the word of God tonight. Don't let it just soothe your conscience. Let it prick your conscience. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Surrender your life to the word of God tonight. Give up all your sin and foolishness. Give up the alcohol and the weed and the cigarettes and the cigars. Give up the filthy language and the lust and sexual immorality and the fornication you're designed to do tonight. Find your satisfaction in Jesus Christ alone. There is no satisfaction truly in your sin. There is some pleasure. I've been there. I've done that. I've done probably most of the sins you're doing tonight. I've done most of those things myself. And the pleasure you receive from those sins only lasts for a short season. But in that season, your life will come to an end. And you'll stand before God for judgment. And He'll give you what you deserve. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God should lead you to repentance, but in accordance with your hardness and your unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in a day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. That's the righteous judgment of God. The goodness God is showing towards you by having patience towards you in your sin, that alone, besides every other way God has cared for you and showed you mercy, that alone should bring you to repentance. That alone should make you rethink your life, examine yourself, and want to give up your sin. You know, and the longer you go on in your sin and are indifferent towards the gospel, the worse it's going to be for you. I just quoted a second ago from Romans 2. You're treasuring up for yourself wrath in a day of wrath. The longer you go on in sin, the more wrath you treasure up for yourself. The harder your heart gets the harder it will be for you to repent if you ever do repent. Sin has a hardening effect in your life. You may think to yourself, well, I'll get right with God later. I'm just, I'm just having a little fun tonight. Just, just receiving a little pleasure. I'll, I'll, give, I'll be serious about God later. I'll get religious later. You may not have later, number one. And number two, who says you won't harden your heart so much through your sin that you'll never repent? 
You're not guaranteed some kind of deathbed to rethink your life and get right with God. How you know we not though? Because you're out here sitting, that's why. Because we went in the clubs. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What does that mean? There's more sin than drunkenness in the club, isn't there? There's more sin than drunkenness in the club, right? So you're saying you weren't sinning tonight? You didn't have filthy words come out of your mouth? You weren't lusting? Yeah. I'm not a fool. I used to go to the clubs myself. There's more than just drunkenness in the clubs. There's all kinds of sin in the clubs. The only kind of club in the Christians that do is outside the clubs calling the clubbers to repentance. Christians don't go to clubs and hang out with the wicked. The Bible says that we should not yoke up together, be yoked together with the unrighteous. What fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? Or Christ with the devil? The 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. That's God's word to you tonight if you're claiming to be a Christian. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch the unclean thing and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, perfecting holiness includes who you're hanging out with. It includes that. Because there's no fellowship of light with darkness. When light is shined down, the darkness flees. And we don't hide as Christians, we don't hide our light under a basket or put it under a bed. Who has lights under their bed, under, their, under a basket? You put it on a dresser. Lights are on the ceiling for a reason, to shine the light into the room, to put away the darkness. And if you can go in the club, you, you're in darkness. If you claim to be a Christian, you're in darkness. Now by this we know that we know Jesus if we keep his commandments. He who says I know Jesus and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. You claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but you're living in sin. You're deceiving yourself. The Bible says do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever.